you call my name. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I need the shelter. I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you are my healing. Your love is the end I need it. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my Oh, come let us bow at his feet. 
Continue to do great things. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning. Just getting situated. Thank you, Dan. Before we pray, um, I wanted to remind you of something that I believe is very important for our church at this point, and um, and that's the. Uh, I don't know if any of you still have your marker that we gave you to put in your Bibles or on your refrigerator or somewhere. Um, every morning you have a, a scripture verse and then something to pray for for the church, especially at this time for the PNC, for the staff, for everyone involved. And it's just, I truly believe in the power of prayer and I believe in God's timing. And I think as a church, if we're all praying together for the same thing once a day. What a uplifting thing that could be for ourselves and for our church and our, the whole congregation. And so um, Melissa and I will be at each door at the end. If you've lost yours, we'll give you a new one if you'd like one. So, and um, one of the, oh, uh, one benefit to this, probably by the end of the time you ever stop reading this, you'll know seven verses. <laughs> I look at, there's always a plus to everything, right? They call me the glass half full person. Um, in Proverbs, there's a favorite um, verse of mine. It says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and grateful for not just who you are, Lord of all, King of kings, mighty God, maker of this universe, creator of all, giver of all. Lord, you continue to bless our lives. Lord, when we forget to thank you, give us a mindful nudge to 
just remember that all things come from you. And when things go wrong, Lord, you are there right beside us. You'll walk us through it, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for that. Today, we especially thank you for this church, for this congregation. Lord, you know the timing of our new pastor. You know who's best for us, and we are asking for prayers on our PNC committee, for our staff, for our elders, for our deacons, for our chaplains, for all the volunteers, everyone involved who so wants to do your will, Lord, who gives their time, their talents, their, their monies, Lord, so that we can continue to be viable in this community and in this world. Lord, we are so grateful. And at this time, we want to thank you for, for just giving us this wonderful body of people. We also want to be with those out there who can't be with us together. We pray that the day will come and we'll all be together here. That is before heaven. And Lord, be with those who are hurting, who are sick. Be with those that we continue to pray for. You say, never let up. Never let up. We may not lead someone to Christ, but we may be the impetus that gets them asking, questioning, and, and coming, and, and, and you'll do the rest, Lord. So we just, we have those simple prayers that you will guide us and lift us up, Lord. And now we want to be true, life-changing followers of you. And be with us in our, in our spirit, in our minds, in all our speaking. And now, Lord, we offer you the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The kids may go to Kids Town. In church, as we continue to worship this morning, we invite you to sit or stand as you feel led. We have a new song to introduce to you today. It's all about just this undeserving love that we get from you. Everything together, watch it shine. 
its breath to that show was moved for good for the lamb would conquer death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the soul Church, will you bow your heads with me in prayer? God, you are the King of Kings. And God, we just want to praise you forever for the rest of our days. We know that we cannot deserve your love, God, but we just want to sing glory to you at all times. We're so thankful to be here this morning, God, in your house to be able to sing those praises. And as we prepare to listen to the message that Pastor Rob has prepared for us, God. We just ask that we can be present here in your house and focus on your word and your truth. We love you so very much. And we say all these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, worship band, for leading us in those glorious songs. Well, before we get into the message this morning, I want to... Um, Direct your attention to this little insert that you may have found in your bulletin. Again, we put this in two weeks ago. If you were here two weeks ago, you had a chance. We, we actually spent some time in the service filling these out, um, getting your input in this transition time uh, as we're looking forward to a new pastor. By the way, I'm Rob Perkins. I am the interim stated supply part-time pastor, and um, but these questions... If you didn't fill them out, we really want to hear from you. We want input, the session, the staff. Um, we've, the, the session's already uh, spent time as, along with the staff at looking at the responses that some of you turned in already. But you can leave these at the baskets by the doors. Uh, if you're listening in at home, online, or after the fact, you'll see in the chat box the four questions. You can just actually answer those questions right there in the chat, and uh, we'll collect those. Would you join me in prayer as we prepare to listen to God's Word? God of grace, we thank you that you are the author of all grace, all good gifts come down from you, the Father of lights. This morning, would you prepare our hearts, Father, to receive afresh your word and teach us more about your grace, that we ourselves might excel in grace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read two letters to you to start the message this morning. The first is a letter to Ann Landers. Some of you might remember her columns. Uh, she's the late LA Times syndicated columnist. She actually, I learned this, is the twin sister of the woman uh, who wrote for Dear Abby. And they both use pseudonyms. But uh, yeah, Ann Landers and Dear Abby are, are twin sisters, or were. And uh, so listen to this letter. Dear Ann Landers... The letter from the woman married to the tightwad, she couldn't get an extra quarter out of him, reminded me of my wonderful aunt who was beautifully warm-hearted and had a great sense of humor. 
Aunt Emma was married to a tightwad who was also a little strange. He made a good salary, but they lived frugally because he insisted on putting 20% of his salary, his paycheck, under the mattress. The man didn't trust banks. I suppose if this were today, he would be investing in Bitcoin. <laughs> the money, he said, was going to come in handy in their old age. When Uncle Ollie was 60, he was stricken with cancer. Toward the end, he made Aunt M promise in the presence of his brothers that she would put the money he had stashed away in his coffin so he could buy his way into heaven if he had to. They all knew he was a little odd, but this was clearly a crazy request. Aunt M did promise, however, and assured Uncle Ollie's brothers that she was a woman of her word and she would do as he asked. The following morning, she took the money, which was about $26,000, to the bank and deposited it. She then wrote a check and put it in the casket four days later. <laughs> this is a true story, and our family has laughed about it ever since from Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> All right, the second letter is actually a fundraising letter. It's also a real letter, and you actually have a copy of it on your bulletin. It was written about almost 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul. Listen to this letter to God's Word. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete uh, <clears throat> earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before we go any further, I want to say I understand people get really nervous in the pews when we start talking about giving, right? I don't know if you can see the caption here, but the caption for those of you in the back says, that was the best sermon on giving I've ever heard. <laughs> and if you're listening without the picture, there's two guys outside the front of a church standing in their shorts and nothing else. <laughs> don't worry, that won't happen today. I want to reassure you that this sermon is primarily not about giving. It's about grace. It's about grace. In this letter, Paul exhorts the Christians in Corinth to excel in this grace of giving. And that's the message of the theme today. How do we excel in the grace of giving? So the grace of giving, we're going to look, first of all, what's the source of grace? We're going to talk about having a heart of grace and finally, what's a strategy for us for gracious giving? So giving's involved, but the key here is that 
We're going to excel in the grace of giving. And, and that's kind of a trick phrase because grace actually means gift. It, it appears six times in this passage, actually. The word, the, uh, the Greek word charis, which is translated sometimes grace, sometimes gift. It's translated one time here as privilege or joy. And so giving, actually, the secret of, of gracious giving is to discover that, that giving is a gift for the giver. It's not an obligation. It's not a burden. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that. Now, although we finished recently our series on the book of Acts, we are looking at a passage today that's directly related. And I'm gonna, I've shown a lot of maps when I've had Acts sermons, so I'm going to show one more map here. Uh, this is a letter, actually, that Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth. Okay, that's one of the places he visited on his second missionary journey. And he is trying to raise money, and he's talking about Gifts that were collected amazingly, just overflowing with generosity from churches in Macedonia, okay? Another part of his journey, on his second missionary journey. Churches like Philippi and the Thessalonians are in that Macedonian area. And uh, Corinth was a place that he, this letter that we just read from uh, is in Greece, modern-day Greece, and uh, he's speaking about the Macedonians, and he's describing their amazing gift that they had put together, even though they were poor, to give to the churches, uh, to the Christians in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had suffered a famine. And you can imagine how much it warmed Paul's heart that his own Gentile converts in these faraway places, far away from the heart of the church in Jerusalem, were giving sacrificially to help their brothers and sisters who were Jewish Christians all the way in Jerusalem. So Paul's ministry has come full circle. And that's really the proof of the power of the gospel, when it actually has an effect in people's lives and pours out in rich generosity. So first of all, let's talk about the source of grace. We want to learn to excel in this grace, this gift of giving. So in order to do that, to become truly generous followers of Jesus... We must understand that God is the source of all grace, of all gifts, of really everything. And as I said before, giving is actually a gift to the giver. That's the grace, the, the, the good news, the grace that you experience when you discover the source of grace. Now, Paul has kind of used an interesting technique to motivate the, math, uh, the Corinthians, to be more generous. They sort of had a good intention. They made some good promises a year before. But now he's really, he's kind of pushing them. And the way he's doing it is he's comparing them to other Christians that are really generous. And I don't know what we think about that, but that's what he's doing in this letter. And uh, he says, I want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Very strange sentence there. You know, they're poor, they're persecuted, they're having a severe trial, but they're joyful. They're joyful. And one of the results of that is generosity that overflows. I testify they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they, and this is amazing, they urgently, they pleaded for the privilege to be able to share in this gift. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us also. See, their generosity is a direct result of God's grace, of God's goodness. Um, one of the reasons why people don't give generously or... or maybe are stingy, that's kind of the opposite of generosity is stinginess, is because of fear, right? Sometimes we don't give because we're afraid that if we give, we won't have enough for ourselves, okay? But the Macedonians had discovered God's incredible grace was always there. It never failed to backstop them. So even though they were poor, even though they were suffering, they could give generously and trust that God would meet their needs, they had learned the secret that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 10, where he said, freely, freely, 
you have received. You and I have received freely, freely. So freely, freely give. And, you know, in Acts 20, Paul actually says, he, he says he's quoting Jesus. The interesting thing is you can't find this quote in the Gospels, but you find it in Acts. And so Jesus must have said it sometime. It wasn't recorded in the, in the New Testament. Other than Paul says that Jesus said that it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's great to get a gift, but it's even better to give. In other words, that's the gift to the giver. Now, the real secret of discovering the grace of giving and excelling in the grace of giving is the principle I'm going to talk about right now. And it is the principle that we are trustees. And that means we are not owners of anything. Devout Jews understood the principle that God owns everything. It's throughout the Old Testament. Here's a typical verse in Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. That means you and me. We belong to God. The earth belongs to God. This building belongs to God. Our automobiles out in the parking lot belong to God. Every single thing that you can think of in the whole universe belongs to God. He is the owner. And if we are not owners, but we're trustees, or another word for trustee is stewards, okay, but trustee is a little more common word we might understand. When you're a trustee, you're entrusted to take care of somebody else's money or things or portfolio or uh, investments or inheritance or whatever. So that's what a trustee is, and we are trustees, and we are not owners. It's part of human dignity to be able to care for something. When God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, the first thing that he did is he said, creation is yours. Rule over it. Be stewards. Take care of this. And that's part of our dignity, and every human being should have that dignity to have trusteeship or stewardship over something. Now, a lot of people worry, uh, and they, they get sort of antsy about... Some of the things the, the Bible says about money, material possessions, and wealth. And they think, well, you know, look at the early church. They were, they were practicing communism, and communism is, is bad. We know that. It's just a bad system. It doesn't work. Well, actually, they weren't practicing communism. They weren't practicing capitalism either. And there's a difference, and I want to give this definition. Capitalism says that we own things. We are the owners and because we're the owners of things, we can do whatever we want with them. Okay, that's, that's what capitalism says. Communism says that we don't own anything, that the, the property, everything, belongs to the people collectively. And that means what we do with it really needs to be subject to the will of the community. That's the definition of communism. Now, the Bible teaches that neither one of those is reality. The reality is that God owns everything. So how we use everything needs to be subject to what God wants done. And it's part of human dignity to, to have some say and control over things as a steward, as a trustee. And, and so that's why what sort of appears as private ownership is very clear in the Bible. Everybody, people, early Christians in Acts, they had lands, they had houses. We know that because they would sell them from time to time and get, bring the proceeds as a gift. So they had ownership in the sense that they didn't just like contribute everything and, and they weren't practicing communism, but they all knew that everything that they were stewarding did not belong to them ultimately. They were not owners, they were trustees. We are not owners, we are trustees, we are stewards, and we are actually able to enjoy things as stewards. When you're a trustee, when you're taking care of somebody's house, when you're house sitting, you can enjoy it, right? You're in it. You're living there. You're swimming in their pool. You're sleeping in their bed. You're enjoying it. But it's not yours, right? Tim Keller talks about the difference in this regard of being stingy and what he would say is stealing. So if you really own your money and your things and someone comes to you, and asks you to give to the poor, and really pleads with you for your help, 
and you say no, you're just being stingy. That's what stinginess is. But if you're not the owner, if it's actually God's, and those requests come, and you say no, you're actually stealing. You're embezzling from the owner who has put you in charge. God has earmarked large parts of what he's entrusted to you and me for the poor and to help others. And unless we let go, it will destroy us. You know, I think um, one, of, one of the ways I struggle with this is I understand the principle, but then sometimes I'm just, I have this inner knee-jerk reaction when somebody asks me for something. And I start going through this litany in my mind of, well, are they going to use it wisely? You know, if it's a panhandler, oh, are they, do they really want food? Hmm, I smell alcohol in their breath. Or, oh, they don't look like, I think they're lying. And I go through this whole thing and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm super um, suspicious, right? And I guess what I would say is I'm trying to keep myself as a steward of God's good gifts from being taken advantage of. I wouldn't want God's gifts to be abused by someone else, right? So th this is how I rationalize my own reluctance sometimes to give. And uh, this has been a, a long, many years struggle for me. And one of the ways that I have seen God help me to resolve that is to think of what kind of a person I want to be. What kind of a person am I becoming? And there's kind of two choices, right? I can be the person that makes sure that nobody ever takes advantage of God's people. Nobody ever abuses God's gifts. But that's going to make me really suspicious of people. It's going to make me feel stingy and appear stingy to other people, but even though I'm doing it for God because I'm trying to be a good steward, that's one end. The other end of the spectrum is, hey, what if I just, like the Bible says, freely, freely you've received, freely, freely give, right? God didn't fully check out our resumes before he decided to give to us, right? He didn't make sure that we were perfect and we would never abuse his good gifts. I've abused a lot of his good gifts, he gave freely. So if we err on the other side, well, people may take advantage of us. That homeless person might use the money to buy drugs or alcohol instead of lunch. Um, someone might be lying when they're asking for help. That person that really just needs one month of rent, they may be irresponsible and then they'll be in the same fix one month later. So do I want to be the kind of person that says, no, I'm not going to let you abuse that? Or do I want to be a person that sometimes gets taken advantage of, but that has an open heart, that freely, freely gives? And that's, that's my personal struggle. I am still, I'm trying to work myself over there. And I, I need to pray. I need to be reminded every time I get asked and I feel that little uh, clench in my gut, okay, it's not your money. It's the Lord's. There's plenty more where that came from. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Err on the side of being more generous because I'm not, you know, other people might be really just very irresponsible with money. Maybe you're on the other side too much and you do need to work on the responsibility part. I'm over here. I got to work on the generosity. Just be more free. So that's me. When we understand the source of giving, that God gives us grace and that he made us, makes us trustees and not owners, then... It helps our hearts to be in the right place, not stingy, not stealing. So let's talk about our hearts, having a heart of grace. Okay, so out of the most severe trial, um, the Macedonians' overflowing joy, their poverty, welled up in generosity. Interesting equation, right? Suffering, poverty, but they were still able to give, and they urgently pleaded for the privilege and la uh, last week, Andy um, and Diane shared their testimony about how God's been working in their life to help them uh, become more generous. And Andy told that story about an older woman in the church. I don't know which church it was. It might have been this church or another church. And she had fallen on hard times. She was very elderly. And the elders of the church, uh, responsible for stewardship, I assume, went to her thinking they were doing a great thing, thinking they were being very magnanimous and said to her, we just want you to know you're, you've fallen on hard times. You don't have to give to the church anymore. 
And to their surprise, she broke down in tears. And like the Macedonian, she, she started literally pleading with them, don't take away, I've lost so much, don't take away my ability to give to the Lord's work. Would that we could all have hearts that were like that woman, like the Macedonians. Um, God ultimately cares more about our hearts than the stuff or the gifts or the, you know, how much we're able to give. Now, two weeks from now, we're going to have Consecration Sunday. Consecration Sunday is not so much about consecrating our gifts or our pledges. It's really about consecrating ourselves, our lives to God because it's our hearts that matter. They did, uh, they did not do as we expected, Paul says, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then in keeping with God's will. Giving themselves to the Lord, giving ourselves to the Lord is what God cares about. Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us not to store up treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but to store up treasure in heaven where there's no moths, no rust, no thieves. And uh, he says something very interesting. He says, for where your heart is, sorry, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I want to ask you, where is your treasure? Is it in heaven or is it on earth? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but in your mind, if you think it's in heaven, raise your hand. And if in your mind, and if you think it's on earth, raise your other hand, okay? Now, this is a difficult question to answer honestly. It really is. I think we all would want to say, in heaven, we're in church, of course. Our treasure's in heaven. But a better way to discover the real answer to that question is I like to work backwards from Jesus' statement. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, we all want our treasure to be in heaven, But let's do a little test. Let's do what I call a heart test. Let's see where our heart is, and then Jesus' statement will tell us the reality of where our treasure is. So, where is our heart? Where is your heart? Let me give you three little questions to ask to see really if, if your treasure is more earthly than heavenly. And the first is the question of worry, all right? Do you worry? Do you worry about money? In other words, do you have anxiety about, is there going to be enough? Am I going to be able to pay for my kids' college? Are we going to have enough to retire on? Are we going to be able to make this month's rent? Does it wake you up sometimes at night? Do you have that little, little itch of nervousness? Okay? All right? Second test, do you envy? Do you sometimes see people that have more Or they're, you know, they just seem to not worry about money and just kind of have that little twinge of, ooh, I wish, man, I would like to have a house like they do. Oh, wow, I wish I had a boat like them. You know, oh, I wish, gosh, they have a house up at Tahoe or whatever it is. You know, I do those little, those little things sometimes come into your mind. And then I call it the fondle test. Do you fondle your things, right? (laughs) Things that, that are really special right? Like, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, my, my new Apple Watch, right? I, I waited seven versions or six versions. <laughs> I had the original and finally gave up the ghost. But I'm like, oh, this is so neat. You know, how often do I just like look at it, play with it? Or, you know, if you're a uh, Tolkien fan, remember Gollum, like he would, he had his ring, his precious, right? And he would just always take it out and look at it. You know, that was his treasure, And it ended up possessing him instead of him possessing it. Well, that's just a test to see where our heart is and where then our treasure is. I like what Corey Ten Boom said once. She said, I have held many things in my hands and I've lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Friends, God cares about our hearts, not our money. Are we consecrated to him? If we are consecrated to him, our Treasures will follow. Our money will follow. All right, let's talk about a strategy to wrap this up for gracious giving. So this is really the answer to the question um, of how 
and how much do we give? This is the practical stuff, right? So how do we get to the place like the Macedonians where we just well up with generosity and we see giving as a grace, as a gift for us, not, and a joy and a privilege, not a burden, not sort of a guilt thing. You know, you may not feel like that right now. You may feel like, ah, oh, giving, you know, my church wants me to give, my whatever wants the school, kid's school wants me to give, the government wants me to give, everybody wants me to give. Um, so, God, come on, you know, why do you want, want it too? You might feel guilty. I'm not giving enough. You might feel burdened. You might feel like, why did I come to church today? <laughs> Well, first, let's remember that Paul said, I am not commanding you. Friends, this is a, God is a light touch in this area. He really is. Even though the Bible talks so much about our possessions and money and materialism, it's not because God needs it. It's because He loves us so much. And He knows that this is a really important area. And if we, if we allow our things to possess us, we're going to be miserable. We'll be destroyed by them. But the, the, even the Apostle Paul won't tell us how much. He's not going to dictate, all right? But he wants to test the sincerity of our love. We're not owners, we're trustees. Okay, so how? How do we get there? And how much should we give? Well, Paul reminds us of our model. Jesus is our model. How much did Jesus give? Right? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the co-heir, eternally reigning with the Father in heaven. Everything is His. He was there when the world was created. And yet our Lord Jesus emptied Himself, Paul says in Philippians. He gave that up. And He did it. Why? For you and me, out of love. He sacrificed Himself. He became limited. The eternal Word became a human being, finite. You know, he could only be one place at one time while he was on this earth. He had to learn how to talk and eat and walk, just like us. And then ultimately, he gave up his life. You know, he didn't just give part of, you know, a little bit, the leftovers. He gave all. He was all in. Well, that is our model. He said, I'm going to die for you. Jesus said, I've got to pay your penalty. And now that Jesus has done that on the cross, which we'll celebrate in just a moment, we have tremendous riches. We have eternal life. We are co-heirs with Jesus. We're part of God's family. We have acceptance. We have power through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. God's life in us. When we realize that we have these incredible riches... It changes our perspective on, on all these sort of mundane, worldly things that ultimately will pass away. Someone once asked J.D. Rockefeller's um, financial advisor after he, had, after he was, uh, had passed away, they said, how much did J.D. Rockefeller leave, end up leaving? And he said, he left it all. right? <laughs> so how much should we give? Practical question. <laughs> well, Jesus is our example. He gave it all. Um, I don't think we're all supposed to run out into the, you know, and die. So we are here as stewards, but we are to give just overflowing, knowing that it's God's, and He's not going to run out, and actually He's looking for people that are very free channels of his blessing. He really is. So how should I give? Well, the Bible gives us two guidelines real quickly. The first is the tithe. Uh, this is in the Old Testament. One place, Leviticus 27, a tithe, which basically means a tenth. Okay, A tenth of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. That means it's set apart. So this Notion of a tithe, a tenth, means a tenth of, this was kind of the rule for, for Israel. You know, Muslims are only required to give 3%. They give 3%. I think uh, Jews give 2% or 3%. 
But God's people in the Old Testament, it's, it's interesting because I don't think modern day um, Judaism supports the 10%. I'm not, I could be wrong in that. Certainly Muslims, it's 3%. But in the Old Testament, it's assumed that this is, you know, it's holy to the Lord. And it's the first 10%. It's, people say, is it before taxes or after taxes? It's before taxes. It's the first fruits. It's the best, actually. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But here's the thing. People say, well, you know, that's, that's easy for, you know, a wealthy person. That's really easy to say. If, if you're rich, 10% is nothing. But I'm struggling, right? I'm living on a pension, or I just, I only make whatever. Well, let me, let's put that in perspective for a minute, okay? I believe that the tithe is actually the great leveler. I believe it's just as hard for somebody that's poor to give 10%, or it's just as easy as it is for somebody that's really rich to give 10%. It's really, really hard, just as hard for them. Now, let me give you an example. Hey, this is the encampment in Oakland, one of them. And uh, the poverty line right now in California for this year, for a family of four, is $35,600. And um, a tithe, a weekly tithe for a person at the poverty line in California would be $68 a week. Now that seems like a lot for somebody living in poverty. On the other hand, you know, it's... $68, $68, right? It's, it's a couple trips to, you know, Pizza Hut and McDonald's and Starbucks, right? Okay, well, let's, let's look at uh, this guy. <laughs> this guy became the richest man in the world ever this week. His net worth crossed $300 billion based on the price of Tesla's stock, okay? Um, it has been estimated that last year he made $140 billion dollars between April and April. Now, most of that had to do with the appreciation of his stock price. But for Elon Musk to tithe, you say, oh, he could tithe, it's so easy, right? He's so rich. Guess what? He would have to give weekly $269 million to the church every week. You know, well, maybe it's easy for him, but I'm thinking maybe that's not that easy. But if it is easy, I think we should invite him to join this church. (laughs) Right? All right. The reality is, if you don't tithe, it's pretty hard. It it can seem like a lot. But if you've learned and it's become a practice growing up or, or over time, it really is not that difficult. And it really is something that, that can bless you and that can become a source of joy. The best time to learn to tithe is when you're young or when you're broke, <laughs> okay? If you can't give 10% when you're making $15 an hour, which $600 a week, that's $60. If you can't do that, how will you be able to give 10% when you're making $150,000 a year? It's going to be tough if you haven't learned that discipline. Um, there was this farmer who, uh, his, his cow... Uh, calved, and he, was, he was, was shocked because it was twins. He had two calves. And he went to his wife and he said, Honey, it's so exciting. I thought it was just going to have one calf, but it actually had two calves. So I'm so happy. I've decided that I'm going to give one of them, I'm going to sell one of these calves and give the proceeds to the Lord. I'm just so joyful. And uh, a few weeks later, he came in and he said, Oh, honey, it's terrible. Something terrible happened today. The Lord's calf died. <laughs> And she said, I don't remember us choosing which calf was the Lord's. And he says, oh, yes, I know. That first day I said, that was the Lord's calf. (laughs) And, you know, the reality is that for a lot of us, it's always the Lord's calf that dies, right? But God wants us to learn to give him the best fruits, fruits, the first fruits. Um, Last thing, pledging, okay? Pledging, because we're in two weeks. You know, you, you got a uh, letter this week, hopefully, if you're a member of the church, if you're part of the church family. By the way, if you're not a part of the church family, this, this message and this uh, month of Thanksgiving um, stewardship emphasis is really family business, and you can kind of listen in, but we don't want you to feel any pressure. This service and the church is a gift to you if you're just checking out the faith. Um, we're so glad you're here. We love you. Uh, but if you're part of the church family, you got one of these pledge cards. 
And uh, we want you to take some time to really think about this. And, um, you know, what is pledging? Why do we do it? A pledge is a non-binding faith promise, non-binding faith promise to give a certain amount to Covenant Community Church in 2022 based on not your ability, but the Lord's faithfulness to enable you to be a steward. Now, God is, like I said a little earlier, I said God is looking for faithful channels of his gifts. And he's, he's looking for people that are willing to take a step of faith. Okay? It's non-binding. But how much would you like God to be able to enable you to give next year? That's, that's something to pray about. Talk about with your family and your, your household over the next couple of weeks before you make your pledge. Um, this is really a principle that, that I, I call it offense and defense. Um, this is from the message version of, of uh, a verse we're going to look at in a couple weeks, but it's Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. He says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. Okay, so I like to think of pledging as responsible giving, okay? It protects us defensively, and it also, there's an offensive side. The, the defense is it, it keeps us from sort of just responding emotionally. A lot of people think it's more spiritual. Oh, no, I don't pledge. I don't pledge. I just, that's not, that's not spiritual. I just, I give when I feel moved, right? <laughs> Have you ever been up really late, and you're kind of nodding off on the couch at about 1230 at night, and one of those things comes on with those um, neglected puppies, those dogs that are, you know, <laughs> I've been so tempted to write a big check. <laughs> They're always late at night when you're like, you don't have your wits about you. But the Bible says we should take time. We should be thoughtful about giving. We're stewards. God will hold us responsible for how we care for his resources. So we need to be guarded against just reacting out of an emotional appeal, right? We also should guard against being the, the arm twisting, right? We shouldn't be made to feel guilty. I always feel guilty. It's like, oh, gosh, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to write a check for those dogs. I feel sad for them. But, oh, now I'm like, oh, you're such a, you're such a hard-hearted person. You're not writing a check for those dogs. You know, <laughs> it's like neither one, neither the sob story or the guilt should be what motivates us. It should be prayerful thoughtfulness of how does God want us to use his resources to bless his kingdom, and then the offense, I said it's a, a faith promise, right? It gives us an opportunity to trust God, to go a little further, to, you know, to, to allow our giving muscle to be stretched, right? Would you like God to bless you so that you could give twice as much next year as you gave this year? Or do you want to just give what you gave this year and, you know, well, okay, God, God I, I probably won't be blessed, so I better not, I better not up my pledge, now, that's, that may sound kind of cavalier and just maybe a heartless way to say it, but the reality is I think God wants us to take a step of faith, and pledging gives us that opportunity. So I want to challenge us. In two weeks, we are going to have Consecration Sunday. Discuss and pray with your spouse, with your household, about what you might trust God to be able to give next year to the church. If you've never tithed, why not say, God, I want to I start tithing. Help me to tithe. Let me figure out what my income is, and let's see if I can make a pledge and see what I can do, if I can give 10%. If you've been tithing, I want to challenge you. See that, you know, the Bible pretty much sees that as a starting point. Maybe increase it by 1%. If, you give, if you've been giving 10%, let's see if you can give 11%. Maybe try to give 1% each year or more. Do you, think, do you think God could take care of you if you made that, that pledge, that promise, that, that challenge? Whatever it is, I want to challenge all of us to set a goal to excel in this grace of giving. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are the author of all good gifts. You are the, the one who showed grace to us in Jesus. And uh, Lord, we all want to grow. We want to grow as disciples. We want to grow in grace. And we want to grow in generosity in this grace of giving. So help us, Lord. Help us to trust you. Help us to uh, take a step of faith that would force us to depend more on you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, friends, we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And what I love about the Lord's Supper is it illustrates this principle that Jesus gave it all. He, Jesus was all in. He gave his very life. He didn't hold back. He wasn't kind of like, well, gosh, if I die, I won't be around to help and heal people anymore. No, he just, he trusted God. He entrusted his whole life into the Father's hands and allowed himself to be arrested, beaten, and ultimately crucified as a criminal on the cross. And he did it out of love for you and me. He is our example. He is our forerunner so that when we wonder, well, can, can we take a step of faith? Can we risk something in faith for God? Well, he gave it all for you and me. I think the answer is yes. And that's who we celebrate here around this table. Um, just before Jesus, on the last night before he was arrested, he took bread with his friends and he, after giving thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, whenever we celebrate this meal, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we celebrate the Lord's death, the Lord's giving 100% giving it all for us until he comes again. Lord, we pray that these elements, these simple elements of bread and cup would become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, who didn't hold back. Lord, may you strengthen us as we eat, as we partake, Lord. Would you encourage us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and go from this place ready to give more generously, more freely, more faith-filled than we have up until this point. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's eat together with thankful hearts.
Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. worship team. What a great day to celebrate being in the Lord's presence and um, being together. Um, my name is Sherry Marcus. I want to welcome you. If this is your first time at Covenant or this is your first time online watching, we want to welcome you. We're glad you're here. If you're in here in person, we'd love for you to stop by the Welcome Center on the way out and our deacons have a gift for you. Um, there's a lot of things happening. It's that season, and we get to do things again, and it's so wonderful. And so this coming Friday is our packing party for Operation Christmas Child. We're super excited about filling those shoe boxes that are going to go across the world to some kids in need with the gospel message. If you would like to be a part of helping us this week in preparing for that, come see me after service. Um, but we'd love to see you at the packing party uh, this Friday at 6.30. Also, our Young at Heart, which is uh, anybody... I think it's 50 and older. I'm not there yet, so I don't pay attention. I still hang out with youth group kids, man. Come on. That's really what will keep you young or sometimes feeling really old, too. But uh, they're having a, a potluck dinner on uh, Saturday, November 20th at 530 in Kidstown, the building next door. We'd love for you to be a part of that. If you are in that group, they are a fun group. And I do look forward to the day where... Well, I don't want to be older, but, like, I look forward to hanging out. I like older people. They're a lot smarter than the rest of us, I find. The Gingerbread House Party is a really fun event for everybody. You don't have to be 50 and older or 50 and younger. Anybody can come. It's Friday, December 3rd, right in here at 6 o'clock. You can sign up online or see the bulletin for details about how to be a part of that so much fun. And we had to do it in our homes last year, so I'm really excited to walk around and see everybody's creations in person. So we're excited for all the things that are coming up. But um, Rob, I just thank you for that message this morning and just a good reminder of uh, what God has called us to do. And we're so grateful for the things he actually has entrusted us with, and we want to be wise and discerning and gracious. And um, it is a gift to be a, give, to be a giver back um, and to of the things that he's entrusted in to know that. And so today is a deacon's fund offering. It's a quarterly offering that we take that goes specifically to care to the needs that come up with people within our congregation. So if you'd like to be a part of giving towards that today as well, there's envelopes in your seat pockets in front of you. And um, otherwise, we're going to just, there's lots of ways online. If you're home, or ways to, to give. And um, we're just going to go in to prayer now and ask God to, to bless these offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us enough to give us your son, and that is truly the greatest gift. And everything that we have is truly yours, and we ask that you would help us to not hold it so tightly, but to remember whose it is and for who it, it benefits in your kingdom, Lord. And we ask that you would give our leaders wisdom, and you would give us gracious hearts, and... Um, God, just please bless and multiply the gifts that you're about to receive today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Rob to come up and give us a lesson on the way out. Thanks, Sherry. Boy, I, that was a, so exciting, full of energy, all the wonderful things the church is doing. You, that was great, Sherry, until you kind of got, you kind of dug yourself into that hole about the, the, 50, the 50 years thing. But anyway, you, got, you almost got out. That was pretty good. But anyway, um, great opportunities. As you go out today, remember that you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for us he became poor, that we in his poverty might become rich. Freely, freely we have received. Freely, freely give. Would you stand? Go in peace and may the grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep you now and forever.